All right, uh, I'm going to talk about event sourcing in Go. This is going to be uh, my journey into it. My name is Matt Ho. Uh, I'm a technologist. I've been in the Valley for a long time, mostly with, uh, well, with both small and large companies. Uh, if you guys are familiar with City Car Share, uh, I built the technology for that back in the early 2000s. Uh, more recently, I started a company with some friends called Keaton that was acquired by Salesforce uh, 10 years or so ago. So I've been working with both large and small companies. Uh, and really, like many of you, I've kind of had a journey that's led me to event sourcing, and I thought I'd share that with you guys. If you rewind the clock to the, uh, the good old days, way back when, most application architectures looked like this. You had an app server, you had a database, life was good. It was really simple to understand. It was easy to scale up uh, when you wanted to figure out uh, does all this stuff need to belong in a transaction? Transaction boundaries were very easy to maintain. There were a lot of pros to it. But unfortunately, it wasn't all pros, as you guys know. Over time, because of uh, various reasons, most monoliths that I've seen uh, eventually turned into this. Right? Very difficult to work with calcified interfaces. Not to say that they're not good in some places, but um, it seems like as a community, we're moving farther and farther away from that. Uh, but that notion of a app server stuck to a database is a really powerful notion. It's very easy to understand. Uh, these days, I think, we call it a bounded context. Right? So rather than having all the applications stuck together, we realize that, OK, great. We can have a defined portion of the application stuck together. It can own its own database. And we'll call it a bounded context. And if we stick a lot of them together, we get this thing called microservices. Woohoo! Uh, microservices for me made life a lot easier in that it was teams could move more independently from another and not have to worry about stepping on each other as much. Uh, but my experience was as I fell in love with it, I also saw that there were some negative sides to it too. And the challenge is now you've got all these services that need to find out about each other, that need to communicate with one another. And all of these has to be done in a real-time mode. So if, if one of these servers is not happy, then the whole system gets unhappy. Right? So if one of those goes down, it causes this back pressure that kind of spins right up the system. And what I notice working in these microservice environments is um, for as much as they promise faster productivity, my experience is they came with a lot of complexity. In fact, there was a whole who's who of things that I had to learn and sort of convey to the team so they could effectively work in the microservices world. So just a small list of these things, right? Now folks had to be aware of expand contract cycles because you've got services depending on each other. And how do these services find each other? You know, what happens is if a service is down and I need to keep going? Uh, all of these have concepts that are probably worthy of talks in of themselves. I'm not trying to do that talk here. This is really just sort of things that made me go, hmm, this is really a lot of stuff. And not only are there a lot of concepts, right, that when I have a bunch of services that are all required to process a request, now all of a sudden that 99th percentile, which I didn't care about in the monolith, becomes a real issue for me. Right? Um, there's a whole bunch of technologies now, app services like Console, etcd, Fabio, Kubernetes, that the team has to be at least moderately familiar with to be able to work in this new microservices world. Uh, what I've seen a lot of organizations do is even devote entire teams to building tooling around this microservice architecture to make uh, it simpler for everyone else. And one of the challenges with the tooling is, uh, because it's somewhat arcane the way that everyone's set up, uh, where there's usually, and I put it in here, a lot of scripts that tie things together, usually there's only a small number of people who actually understand this sort of thing. Uh, just for a quick show of hands, how many people here are using microservice architectures? Okay. So I'm not, I'm not trying to pick on you guys. Uh, it's just my own experiences. And I was just trying to see if there's a, another way to do this. And for those people that raised your hands, how many people can recognize some of the issues that I'm pointing out here? OK, pretty much a fair number of them. Uh, in the end, I'm left feeling this way. I'm like, ah, oh, really? Do we have to do all this stuff? Is there another way? And so this was really an exploration to say, well, what, what can we do? Uh, I made up a wish list. This is kind of what I would like in whatever sort of thing gets created. Uh, and I hope, well, here's my wish list. 
I don't ever want to do another upgrade. Early in the Linux days, when it first came out, I loved downloading the kernel. I loved building my own version. I loved the multi-stage GCC compilation. I was all down for that. These days, just give me a Docker image. I, I don't care to do that stuff. Uh, when it comes to troubleshooting, I'll happily troubleshoot the stuff I build. But I really don't want to troubleshoot your you know, etcd, zookeeper. A, I'm not that good at it. And B, even if I was, I really don't want to do it. I'd rather focus on delivering business value rather than troubleshooting all these things. And the challenge is, even if they're containerized, at some point it will fail. And it's your responsibility for choosing the software to be able to fix the system. <coughs> the third issue is I don't want to pay a fortune for it. I don't want to have to spin up a bazillion instances. I don't want to have to manage a bunch of servers. I don't want to have my finance person come to me and say, why is your AWS bill this? Uh, I often work with a lot of junior developers. And uh, complex systems are very difficult to handle. So I want a system that's easy to explain to someone, where I can basically set them aside you know, for a few minutes and say, here's how it works, and they can be off to the races. And lastly, uh, while I would love to have the problem of scaling, I don't want to have to think about it. I want somebody else to deal with this. So this is kind of my wish list going into the, uh, this event sourcing world. Um, probably one of the big jumps for me to getting into this was a project that my team did uh, last year. And we did this for T-Mobile as part of their T-Mobile Tuesdays. Uh, T-Mobile wanted to deliver stock to their customers as part of their T-Mobile Tuesdays program. The challenge was, there was no system to do this, and we had about four months till the launch of the program. And so we had to build from scratch a stock distribution and accounting system in four months and have it robust enough that we'd be comfortable with the SEC, FINRA, as well as uh, any sort of reputation that T-Mobile may have. And as you might expect, uh, we forego the traditional microservices approach. We went with an event-driven approach. Um, the project launched on time. It was very smooth. T-Mobile himself was super excited. Uh, and my big takeaway from that is um, there really is something to this event-driven stuff. Uh, this system was built on top of DynamoDB. There was no SQL within the system. It was just a series of uh, DynamoDB calls. And that really kind of opened my eyes what you can do when you just give, when you, you uh, surrender to AWS and just give in and do it its way. So the heart of the talk, what is event sourcing? Uh, let me start off and use a domain that we're probably all familiar with, e-commerce. And I'll just use this as an example. Uh, so the example we work with, and we'll call this the bounded context, is just a simple one. It's an order with an order item. I'm not even going to go through the order items. I'm just going to kind of show you this as a, a general concept. Most of you are probably familiar with something that looks kind of something like this. Right. If I were to go and design this in a traditional uh, relational database microservice architecture, uh, I'd probably end up with something like this. And I'm, I'm hyper-simplifying, so forgive me if I'm leaving out a bunch of stuff. In the database, there's probably a order ID someplace. And when the order is created, there's probably some state on it that says order created. And when I uh, update it to say, hey, this order is approved, it's now ready to go to the next stage, what I'm going to do is I'm going to smash that state within the database and replace it with something kind of looks like this. Right, so now we've erased the old thing. We've got this new, right, updated the record. Now it looks like that. And when the order gets shipped, uh, we're going to do it again. And now it looks like that. Yeah. Uh, this is probably familiar to everyone on here. Well, if we were to do this in an event sourced way, what event sourcing says is instead of having the database be the current state of the world, um, have the database just be the summation, all the, the deltas that, were, that went into uh, creating that current state. And then you can replay the current state whenever you need to. Uh, as developers, how many people here use Git? Okay. And how many people uh, knew that Git was an event source system? Okay. So with every version control system, what it is is just a series of changes that you save right every one of your commits. And to get to that local, when you do a checkout or a clone or whatever, all it's doing is replaying those commits in the same order that they arrived to re-obtain your file system. Right. We're going to do the same thing then 
But instead of with a file system, we're going to do it with this bounded context object. So we could create events that look like this. <coughs> so our first event was order created. And uh, you can pretend that there's plenty of other fields that are associated with the order created. I'm not going to bother to go into them. I'm just going to kind of put it up here to make this easier. And we can say uh, the first event was order created, followed by order approved, followed by order shipped. And these three events together, when you kind of apply them in the right order, will give you the current state of the order, which is the order was shipped. <coughs> um, how many people here uh, have done or played around with functional programming? OK, great. You're going to understand this then. So effectively, then, the current state of the application uh, is nothing more than a left fold of previous behaviors. You just wrap them on each other, and huzzah, you get the stuff. Uh, I'm going to switch over and just kind of show you this in code now. Ah! Oh, up there. Oh, this is going to be weird. OK. That is so weird. All right, great. <coughs> OK. So I have a little bit of Go code here. And again, I'm hyper simplifying just to uh, illustrate the point. Ah, where is the mouse? OK. I'm hyper simplifying this just to illustrate the point. And so what I've done is I've created three structs, order created, order approved, order shipped. Again, you can add all the properties onto it you want. I'm just leaving them out for simplicity of the model. Um, I've included a struct here which implements what I use for an event source, like the base. And I'll just go into it really quickly. Um, ah, it's too small. So the model itself just has three things. It has the ID, the version, and when this happened. So it's very similar to the, uh, the diagram that we had. Um, do, do, do. All right, so here are the objects. I'm now going to create this bounded context. Um, I could have an array of orders, order items within this order. But again, for simplicity, I'm choosing not to. I'm just going to have the ID of the order, the current version number it's on, when it was created, when it was updated, and the current state of the state. So what does the left fold look like in the Go world? Uh, I'm just going to do a simple switch statement like this. So every time I receive an event, I'm going to switch on the type. And if it's an order created, I'm going to do some stuff. If it's an order approved, I'm going to do some stuff, order shipped. And you can make this as complicated as you like. But what I like is, for the simplicity case, I didn't have to think about ORMs or object mapping or anything like that. It's just straight Go code, which I feel is very much in the Go ethos. Uh, so it's pretty clear to see what's going on here. And now if I go down a little bit farther. I'll just kind of show you then the working example of this. So it actually all fits on the page. Woo! All right, so we're going to make up a fictitious order ID, one, two, three. And we're going to have three events. The order was created, the order was approved, and the order was shipped. We'll instantiate an instance of the order, and then we'll just apply these three events. And at the end, we'll print this out, and we'll say the order was blah, blah, blah on this date. So let's go ahead and run this. Oh, god, that's small. All right. Great. So you can see the order was shipped on that date and that time. All right. Nothing really magical about this code. Um, and what I like about that, going back to the, kind of my wish list, is I feel like I could take someone, show them this, and they could kind of understand and follow along. And if they had to add a new event, they could add that without too much pain. All right. Let's see if we can go back. <clears throat> so what have we done? We've basically just shown these two things. We showed we created a series of events. And that order object is something I'll call an aggregate. Uh, aggregate is a term from the domain-driven design context. And all I'm doing is just applying these events to the aggregate to receive current state. Well, how do I get the events? So to get the events, I can use, and many of you are probably going to be familiar with this pattern, a command. So the command, when passed through a handler, generates the events. All right, so let's take a look at that then. Ah. 
Uh oh. Okay, what you'll see is uh, this thing is basically the same thing as I had last time. Order created, order approved, order shipped. Um, and what I've introduced now are commands. Uh, and again, I'm leaving out all the details um, because they're just not important to the uh, illustrating this. So I've created two commands, one called create order and one called approve order. And as you might expect, they're paired up with create order results in order created, approve order results in order approved. So here's what the logic looks like. And again, you know, it fits all within this, this one view. On create order, I create a new instance of the order created event, and I return the list of events. Um, so again, the command goes through a handler, and this is the handler, and it emits just zero more events at the other end. When the order is approved, um, you can see here, I put a little bit of logic, and I said, you know what? In order for the order to be approved, the state has to be created. So I won't approve a already shipped order or an already approved order. So this command handler gives me the opportunity to kind of reject the command. You know, maybe it's a validation error, a business domain error. Um, but like the uh, event processor, it's just straight Go code. There's no magic. There's no funny business going on. It's very easy to understand. Um, so putting it together. And here's the event handler from before. So now let's go take a look at the main. So in the main, we're going to create the order. So again, here is my order command. And I'm just going to tell the order object to apply this command. And what I get back is a series of events. And I'm going to apply those events in the order that they received, and just making sure that there was no errors on application. Then I'm going to approve the order. Again, I'm going to create the approve command, apply it. Apply all the events that came out the other end and then run it and see what I get. So when I run this, doo -doo -doo. all right, we see that the uh, order was approved, which is what we expect, and here is the time. Fantastic. My only problem with this is a lot of boilerplate code here to reapply the events. You know, there must be something better we can do to make this a little bit easier. And it turns out we can. So in this package that I have, this event source package, um, whoops, uh, I have this notion of a dispatcher. And what the dispatcher does, in essence, is basically that code we just went through before, which is it executes the command, takes the resulting events that happen, and applies them to the, uh, the, the aggregate, the order. And so what we've done is now that code that seemed boilerplate between these guys are, has gone away. And the dispatcher basically has the same interface as the order does. I could just say, dispatcher, create the order, dispatch, approve the order. And uh, when I run this thing, just like before, uh, I get order approved on the state. So fantastic. So far, we haven't done really any magic. All of it's just been straight Go code. Uh, let me get back into this thing. All right. <clears throat> okay. So, so far, everything we've done has been local to my laptop. And it's all well and fine for it to be local to the laptop. But what does it look like when I want to try to put this thing into production? Where does this data go? What do I have to manage? So if we go back to that microservice issue, I don't want to have to manage stuff. I just want it to go someplace. Well as you kind of saw from me going forward in the next slide, um, we had a lot of really good experience with uh, DynamoDB. It was surprisingly robust. And so uh, we figured we would try it with this as well. Uh, so DynamoDB, and just a quick show of hands, how many people here are familiar with it? Oh, almost everyone. So I won't bother explaining it then. Well, I'll do a quick explanation. Uh, DynamoDB is uh, basically a NoSQL database provided by Amazon. Uh, like all other Amazon products, it has this great capacity just to scale up as you turn the number up and you pay more, or scale down as you need less capacity. Um, <clears throat> so what that means is um, we can take this, which is the order created, order approved, order shipped, 
So if this was a relational database, you can imagine we'd have an order ID column, a version column, and then the data column, which might be a blob of whatever data we have. And so if we have three events, we would have three rows in the database. You know, if you had 10 events, you'd have 10 rows, so on and so forth. Um, well, it turns out, because DynamoDB is a NoSQL database, you can play a little trick here. Uh, and the trick you can play is most of these events are going to be very small. Uh, if you have a, an event that's a couple hundred bytes, I would say that's pretty big. But most of these things are pretty small. It's right, a time, a date, a few things in there. A DynamoDB item, which is what they call a record, can store up to 400K of data, which is pretty big. So what happens instead of making each one of these a single DynamoDB item, what if we just kind of smash these together? And what if we took the DynamoDB item and we put a bunch of events in a single record? If you think of most objects like a, uh, I'm really familiar with the, uh, finan the FinTech space, and so uh, brokerage transactions. A typical transaction doesn't go through that many state changes, maybe a dozen, two dozen. Uh, so most of the time, using DynamoDB, your entire event stream fits within a single DynamoDB record, which was a big plus as we were thinking about this. So as you end up with more and more events, you can imagine your DynamoDB table being shaped a little bit like this. So here is four rows. The first row, we'll call this page zero, has events 1 through 99. Page one has events 100 through 199, so on and so forth. So you can cram a metric ton of events into a very small number of DynamoDB records, um, which is a pretty neat thing. So what does it take to actually make this happen? All right, let's uh, go to another code example. All right, here is a, uh, whoops, wrong. I want that slide. Where is the mouse? There we go. Okay, you guys are going to hate this example after a while. All right, uh, so this example, oh, no. There we go. <clears throat> so this example is basically the same one I've been using. Okay, there is the uh, command handler that we have before, the on. Uh, everything is pretty much the same, but now I've done something different. Uh, I'm using this package that I put together for event sourcing. It's very simple. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail about it, just to kind of talk about it at the high level. So it has the ability to use DynamoDB as a store. So here I'm saying in US West 2, there's a DynamoDB table called orders that I'm going to use as my store. And then uh, I'm going to do a little bit of bookkeeping to basically set this thing up. So I'm going to create the repository where all my events are using this store, and then a serializer that knows how to serialize these three objects. So again, from the previous one, here's my dispatcher. And everything at this point is exactly the same. right? I'm creating the order, sending it to the dispatcher, checking it, approving it, sending it to the dispatcher. The only thing I've added here is this load command, uh, which allows me to basically ask the repo, give me the current version of this thing, uh, of this object with ID, the ID I pass in. And what it returns to me is an aggregate. Uh, an aggregate is basically, because I thought interface, <laughs> I wanted something a little bit better than just open close interface. So it's really just anything that accepts an on method. So I need to typecast that back into the original order object, which I do here. And then we'll print out the same thing. So before we do that, let us um, let's figure out how to move this thing around. Huzzah. OK. So here's the orders table in US West 2. Uh, I'll just do a quick refresh. Can I get rid of this? OK. So I'll do a quick refresh, and you'll see there's nothing up my sleeve. And now we'll go ahead and run uh, that command. Um, do, do, do. <coughs> 
So has our order approved on this time? And uh, when I refresh this little sucker, um, here's the key. It's just some random gobbledygook, partition zero. And here's the base64 encoded version of the event. In case you're wondering what's inside there, um, I'm just going to crack it open. And we'll paste it in here, which is a base64 decoder. Decode it, and what you can see is it's just a JSON object. All right, just a very, very simple JSON object. OK. <clears throat> so now we've got a place to put these events that's very scalable, uh, but it's still kind of in this hermetically sealed world. We can create the events, we can stick them in there, we can retrieve them back, but how does it connect to the rest of my application? Where do those pieces go? It turns out DynamoDB has another fantastic service, and it's called DynamoDB Streams. Uh, this is connected to DynamoDB such that Every time you make a insert, update, or delete to DynamoDB, an event gets created and thrown into this thing which you can consume and do something with. When I saw that, and this was for the, uh, the previous project, I was feeling like, this is fantastic. You know? So why is it so fantastic, and why was I just incredibly ecstatic? Well, let's see what we talked about. We got an application that saves its data to DynamoDB. DynamoDB then will dump its stuff out to streams, and it turns out Streams um, can connect to Lambda really simply. And here's where I think Go just shines so much. Because of Go's static binary, because of its low resource consumption, because of its very quick startup time, it's a fantastic candidate to use as Lambda functions. Um, through the Apex package, which I highly recommend, we've been using Go with, uh, with Lambda for a while and just been hugely, I feel, successful with it. Uh, I've talked to other teams that have tried to use Python or Node. And oftentimes, the challenges you hear is, how do I make sure that all of the dependencies I have locally get shipped up to the Lambda container and work there? Um, I don't have to worry about that with Go. What I test locally is almost, well, it's exactly what runs remotely. So just that simplicity makes my life a lot easier. I can't imagine another environment to do this in. So what does it mean now that I have it in Lambda? Well, one use case, which I think is the most, one of the most powerful use cases is, I could take that stream of events, reassemble them, and ship them into Firehose. Firehose is a uh, AWS service that basically will take your stream of data and throw it someplace. Uh, the someplace in this case is S3. And what it does is it creates a directory structure, a little bit like this, where all the events go. And it's not going to look exactly like this, but just think of this as you, you feed events into it and it throws it into this directory structure. They're kind of pseudo timestamps, so you can follow them by time. This is a wonderful thing. All your events since the beginning of time are in this directory. Uh, has anyone here heard or used Kafka? Show of hands. OK. So Kafka is something that we explored using. Right? It's a basic place where you can get this ordered series of events that you can play back. Uh, from a pricing standpoint relative to this, um, for this, I pay, what is it, 20.23 cents or 2.3 cents a gigabyte? to do this right, in S3. And it's highly redundant. It's super scalable, et cetera. Uh, when I do it in Kafka, I need to stand up a number of replicas. Each of the replicas are AWS instances. They're backed by EBS stores. <laughs> I need a zookeeper. There's a lot of servers involved. Oh, no, by the way, even though Kafka is very uh, reliable, I need engineers who understand how to use that. On the other hand, I could just throw it in this bucket. Why would I want to throw it in the bucket? If I just take that bucket and copy it to my local directory, I have all the events that the system has since the beginning of time. How hard is it to take a directory on your local file system and just run all the events to see if your system has changed? Being able to regression test your application is now way, way simpler. Being able to uh, figure out if you've got a bug uh, in the system. If I need to debug, I could take any object. And I could just see the series of events that got it to today. Uh, testing is a lot easier. and because S3 itself also supports Lambda, I can make triggers so that if a new event stream object arrives and I want to do something like a count or send out an email, I can basically watch the new, uh, I can watch Kinesis's or Firehose's delivery into S3, trigger off that to do something else, like a calculation, email, whatever have you. And then 
if I put CloudFront in front of the S3, I can do hyper-fast pulling. So if I want to replay a large number of events over and over again, I don't have to worry about really bogging down S3. Uh, so just to kind of wrap up, I think Firehose goes to a lot of places. If I need a big SQL store, it goes to Redshift. If I need to be able to query it, it goes to Elasticsearch. Uh, I can write more Lambda converters to basically convert the type of the data so it's whatever shape I need for Elasticsearch or Redshift. Uh, here's one of my favorites, uh, though I use a lot, Lambda to SNS SQS. So if you take the event that arrives, let's say it's the order shipped, oftentimes you want to have a side effect process that happens, like sending out an email. Well, if you think about traditional how people do it, they like write to the database and then they send the email out. That's OK, but you have to realize sometimes your server is going to crash and that email is not going to go out. You want a, you, I would like a way to make sure the email goes out at least once. Here, because I can just take the event, throw it into an SNS queue, um, something can subscribe to that to send out the email. So it's a great place, like I say, to handle side effects. You know, if you want to cross bounded context, it's a great way to send things across. Uh, it's great for visibility when things go wrong. So what we found with that T-Mobile system is when something breaks, the way a break looks is the SQS queue in front of something just starts building up. And it's really obvious what's broken because everything has a queue for it. And you can just use the, uh, the built-in dashboard to figure out what's going on. Uh, I'll just throw out other things, you know. Lambda is going to continue to grow. I have no doubt that um, you know, there's more and more things we'll connect it to. And the key thing is having the event in the wrong, raw form is really kind of what enables this. So going back to my wish list and what kind of got me started here, uh, I don't ever want to do another upgrade. I don't know if you'd build your entire system this way, but at least for this section of the system, I don't have any pieces that are my servers in here except my app server. Right? Let me just go back to the diagram. I got my app server, I got Lambda. Everything else is ran, run by AWS. Uh, I don't have to troubleshoot Amazon. There are people that do troubleshooting are way better than me. I don't want to have to pay a fortune for it. Because I'm not really running that many instances anymore, um, when I looked at the bill for T-Mobile, the T-Mobile Tuesdays, I was just amazed. Lambda costs almost nothing. And on top of that, you get hundreds of thousands of free uh, invocations. Um, so it was just fantastic. I feel like I looked at my EC2 build and it was like this, and everything else was like this. And I was like, I want more of this, less of this. Uh, and also for the juniors, having a way to get them involved. Um, creating the events, modeling that is a more senior activity. But if once that event stream is set up, if you tell a more junior developer, hey, can you now send an email when the, uh, can you also send an email when the order was created? Right. How would they do that? Well, there's a little event here that says there's a queue that says order created. Listen to this queue, subscribe to it, send out an email. Right. All of a sudden, you've taken these tasks, and instead of having to understand the whole uh, application infrastructure, how it deploys, getting Docker composed to run locally and all that stuff, now it's just read from this queue and write this thing. Um, and the last one is uh, the thing I get for free. Because it's based on Amazon, and there's no servers of my own, if I want it to scale, I just pay more. Uh, I'm not going to have to re-architect my system. Well, if you get to like Facebook, Twitter scale, you're going to have to re-architect it, but whatever. I mean, that, I can only wish uh, that I had that problem. All right, thank you. You know what? I'm not going to put the pressure on you first this time. San Francisco, because we have a few questions online. Sure. We have more than a few questions online. I didn't do it. Um, okay. Let's start with uh, Victor asks uh, how to make sure events haven't been tampered with. What's the security model around S3 as an event store? So the great thing about S3 is, like every AWS service, um, it's subject to the IAM policies and permissions. So one of the other things I like about this architecture is um, I didn't have to go build anything to create permissioning. Amazon has a great permissioning model. And for S3, it's very, very specific. You can even create an IAM policy that's down to the bucket prefix. Um, so I think there's a lot of built-in stuff that Amazon has for it. All right, Demetrios, I hope I didn't butcher that, Demetrios, uh, asks why DynamoDB instead of uh, Kinesis? Sure. So 
Uh, it turns out it is partly kinesis. Um, DynamoDB uses kinesis on the back end. So if you look at DynamoDB streams, it's really an early version of kinesis. So why not kinesis directly? Uh, it's really the read after write problem. So with DynamoDB, I can write my events and get a consistent read immediately. If I write it to kinesis, I have to wait mm -hmm. until it goes through the kinesis machine before I can do my consistent read. Okay. Uh, Victor follows up with, uh, are you considering a dedicated event store database like Event Store or Eventuate? Um, so here is my personal take. One of the goals I had was I don't want to have to manage a thing. I don't want to have to have a person who knows a database. If I can get Amazon to do it, um, I think those databases are fantastic. There's a lot of great features. Mm -hmm. But what I'm looking for is I just really want to surrender to the cloud, if mm -hmm. you will. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and just have Amazon do it. And yeah. event sourcing, at least how we're using it here, it's such a simple model mm -hmm. um, that I, I, don't know, I feel pretty good about this way. Oh, OK. All right. A oh, one, two. That's it. But I'm going to start back <coughs> there, because I saw his hand first. Mm, I already saw one, two. And uh, don't make me feel guilty by raising your hand in addition. Nope, I'm not looking. Hi. Uh, so I was wondering, how does uh, replay work, especially with large amounts of events, right? So you have multiple partitions, right? And you need to apply all of them. That's right. Every time. Yep. So uh, I'll, I'll just quote Greg Young on this. For the most part, like until you get to a thousand events, don't worry about replay. Like it'll be just fine. If you think about the number of objects that have a thousand events, it's really, really small, and it's usually it's not in a space that I've had to work with. Oftentimes, most things that I've created they have well under 100 different events. And like I was saying, because we're smashing so many events into a single DynamoDB record, it just turns into a single DynamoDB request. You were my next one, yeah, right? It's, I guess kind of a follow-up, perhaps a naive question, but if the events are really separated by time, say mm -hmm. they're 10 years apart, uh, I won't be able to download all that SDK and run it back on my laptop, right? No, no. So if you really have that much stuff, so if you're talking about a single event, um, you can absolutely just pull the single event right off of DynamoDB. Um, if you're talking about going back and you have that much stuff, you can't hold it all, you can create a snapshot at some point. Right? And the snapshot would be like um, what an accounting system does. End of day, here's the end of day close. You don't have to worry about the time beyond that. And very last question. Uh, how do you handle sharding of commands to uh, aggregates? Why do I? Uh, so um, can you have them clarify? Why do I need to shard? It says, can you ask how he handles sharding of commands to aggregates? Aggregates. So I, I, think, I, I think I might understand what he's saying. Um, I'm going to interpret that question as, how do you deal with uh, multiple uh, command handlers being invoked at the same time, potentially causing conflicting requests? Well, one of the wonderful things about DynamoDB is, when you do an insert, update, or delete, you can actually create conditions on the insertion of the request. And one of the conditions is you can do optimistic locking effectively. So if two people try to insert the same you know, event 3, 4, 5, DynamoDB will pick one that wins. The other one will get a failure and have to try again, very similar to how a traditional database works. All right. Thank you so much, Matt. Mm -hmm. yep.